Um, so, this, uh, let's welcome our, uh, the last speaker of the, the section uh, by Wallace. He's going to talk about resources for bosonic quantum computation ad uh, advantage. So the flow is yours. So you have 30 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. Uh, so sorry, uh, I can be a person in uh, person. In person. Uh, this was the original plan, but uh, I tested positive two days ago. So I had to revise my plan, but uh, thanks uh, still for, to the organizers for uh, their flexibility and allowing me to, to present remotely. So this is a uh, joint work with uh, Mathieu Volchars uh, from Laboratoire Casler Brossel uh, in Paris. And uh, it was started when I was uh, last year, uh, still a postdoc uh, at Caltech. Uh, and we finished it uh, while I was joining uh, INRIA early this year, uh, also in Paris. So be before getting to the, the bulk of the, the talk, I want to give a bit of uh, context and motivation. Um, so we usually split quantum information processing in like two big paradigms, uh, discrete variable uh, quantum information processing and, and continuous variable quantum information processing. Uh, but I, I don't think the names are uh, especially good because the, the main difference between those two paradigms uh, is the math that we're using. So the, the discrete variable uh, case usually refers to uh, the use of finite dimensional Hibbert spaces to embed our quantum states. Uh, and we use qubits and qubits that we represent like this. Whereas the continuous variable uh, paradigm, we're dealing with infinite dimensional uh, Hilbert spaces. Those Hilbert spaces, they are separable. Uh, that means they have a countable infinite basis. Uh, so for example, uh, in, in optics, you, you would hear of the uh, particle number basis or the FOP basis. Um, and this um, like paradigm lets you model uh, continuous variables. So, so continuous degrees of freedom uh, of quantum systems in which you can encode information. You can think of it as like being, say, the position or the momentum of a particle. But you can actually also um, use this this paradigm to uh, describe uh, discrete variable uh, and even like infinite discrete variable like a uh, particle number. Okay, and there are a lot of similarities uh, between those two uh, paradigms. So, for instance, uh, to pick one in in the discrete variable setting. Um, we have this like Clifford non Clifford dichotomy where uh, Clifford computations uh, are a set of quantum computations that we can classically simulate uh, efficiently, uh, thanks to the Gottesman Neal theorem. Um, and whenever we add like non, uh, non Clifford elements, sorry, uh, uh, to that uh, uh, setting, uh, then we get uh, like a computational model which is capable of uh, performing uh, BQP complete computation. So, for example, the, the, the T gate is a non Clifford element that we can add to the Clifford set. And in the continuous variable setting, there's a similar um, dichotomy, uh, which this time is between uh, Gaussian and non-Gaussian. So these names come from the fact that in those infinite dimensional Hibbert spaces, you can describe quantum states using functions. Uh, and when that function is a Gaussian function, we, we, we talk about Gaussian states. And, and the rest of the time, we, we talk about non-Gaussian states. Uh, but the main point that I want to convey here is that we have a similar situation where uh, Gaussian computations, in which all the, the states at each step of the computations are Gaussian, they're also classically easy. We have this sort of efficient uh, simulation result. Um, which is actually very, like uses very different techniques from the gottesman neal theorem. Um, and whenever we allow for non-Gaussian uh, elements, then um, we get um, a model that is capable of, um, of implementing BQP complete computations. Okay, so this is one example of a non-Gaussian operation. Uh, this is the so-called uh, photon addition, uh, an application of the creation operator, uh, and it does provide uh, universality in this setting. So these two models, they're pretty well motivated from a quantum computational perspective. Um, so in the discrete variable uh, setting, we have examples of computational models th that are sort of capable of quantum advantage, or at least uh, they claim they, they, they can demonstrate quantum advantage. So the, the Google experiments uh, are a good example of this. Um, and in the continuous variable setting, we have those uh, Gaussian boson sampling experiments, for example. Um, the one that has been performed by uh, USTC in 2020 and, and the more recent one by uh, Zanadu. Um, and essentially those, those experiments, what they claim is that they, they perform computations that are intractable for classical computers. So this is what we usually refer to as quantum computational advantage. And the question that I want to tackle now in this talk is what are the quantum resources, what, what are the, the quantum properties that sort of give you this quantum advantage, this, this edge uh, 
uh, over classical computers, especially for this type of uh, the so-called bosonic computations in this continuous variable setting that are uh, maybe a bit less studied than the discrete variable counterpart. So to get there, uh, this is the outline of the talk. I'm going to present you with some examples of uh, what we call bosonic sampling uh, problems and different uh, variants, and maybe give you a bit of intuition why uh, well, this is a non-trivial problem to characterize the, the, the quantum resources uh, that provide quantum advantage. Um, then I will sort of review recent developments that in introduce a, a measure uh, to quantify non-Goshanity in continuous variable states. Uh, this is called the stellar rank. And based on that measure, uh, I will then get to the main results uh, of uh, our present work that I'm presenting today, uh, which is a, actually a classical simulation result, uh, where we present a strong simulation result um, based on that uh, stellar rank uh, measure. OK, so bosonic sampling uh, problems. This is uh, maybe the most famous uh, example. Uh, it's, it's called boson sampling. It was introduced in 2010 by Aronson and Arkipov. And it consists in sending a bunch of photons into a linear interferometer. They scatter through that interferometer. And in the output, you just measure uh, on each like special line um, how many photons are coming out. Uh, and you repeat the process. This gives you a, like a sampling experiment from some output probability distribution. And it turns out it's hard to simulate the sampling experiment uh, classically. Uh, why is that? Well, because the output probabilities uh, in that uh, model, they're related to a, a combinatorial object uh, that is called the permanent, and th that is essentially very hard to compute. And, and from that hardness of computing the, the permanent, you can actually extract a hardness to sample uh, from that uh, model, from the, its corresponding uh, output probability distribution using a classical computer. Um, and this means you can use that model um, as sort of a basis to demonstrate quantum computational advantage uh, as it has been done. But OK, when, when Aronson Arkipov introduced that model in 2010, um, it was actually very hard to engineer enough photons deterministically to, to actually get a quantum advantage with that model. And so this spurred like a very large line of research um, where, where a lot of different variants of boson sampling were introduced. Uh, to essentially both ease the experimental requirements for implementation and also sort of to investigate um, which scenario um, sort of keeps the quantum advantage and, and which scenario loses it. So uh, there's a bunch of examples of this. So the, the, the picture of the experiment that I showed you is, is one of the variants that is called Gaussian boson sampling, uh, where you replace the input photons by Gaussian states. So effectively, you would feel this you know, makes it slightly simpler, uh, right? Because now you're using Gaussian states, uh, and, and they're part of this classically simulable um, class. Uh, but actually, when you keep on doing like photon number measurement, photon counting in the output, uh, you can show under sort of similar conjecture that uh, this is also hard to simulate classically. Uh, you can also think of introducing a time reversed uh, version of this. So we did this with collaborators a few years back now. Um, and the interest of that model is that uh, now it's the measurements that are Gaussian and the input is, is uh, non-Gaussian, uh, but the measurement, they come uh, in the lab with much higher efficiencies. Um, but actually, so there has been many other uh, proposals in, 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 in those directions um, and with, with similar goals, like exploring uh, the realm of a sub-universal model giving new quantum advantage in, in those infinite dimensional Hubble spaces. And so for all these models, you can ask, OK, what are the quantum resources? Uh, if I know that um, at least at the theoretical level, those models are, are hard to sample classically, can I sort of pinpoint uh, what resource uh, gives me this? Is it non-Goshenity? Is it entanglement? Uh, and how can I uh, quantify it? And so um, faced with that uh, question, with uh, Mattia, we were thinking that one of the difficulties of, of sort of answering this question is the fact that those resources, they can be present um, in like both the input, the measurement, the evolution. Um, and this is sort of a, a barrier to getting a proper characterization of those resources. Um, and so you'll see how this is uh, coming up later uh, in the talk. Um, so in, in the talk, due to time constraints, I, I will only be focusing on the question of non-Goshenity. Uh, in the paper, we're also discuss, discussing how this relates to entanglement. Um, and so now I'm going to present the stellar rank, which is a measure of non-Goshenity that we use um, essentially to capture uh, the computational power of, of a, a bosonic sampling experiments. So uh, to recap, our goal is to identify quantum computational resource. 
And our starting point is to say, okay, what are the sort of less resourceful states, the most classical states? Um, so there's good intuition for that in, in optics. Uh, those are the states that come out of a laser when you just press the button. And, and these are the so-called coherent states. So this is their expansion in, in particle number uh, basis. Uh, and those states, they form sort of an overcomplete basis uh, of your Hibbert space. Um, so a very, very natural thing to do is to, to say, if I have some state psi and I want to know well, uh, how resourceful the state is, uh, I can instead ask uh, how how classical is it? So I can sort of uh, sandwich it with a, with a coherent state and ask, okay, what, what's the value? What, what's that object? And so here you see that those coherent states, they're parameterized by some uh, amplitude. This is a, a complex number, uh, okay? Um, so taking the inner product between coherent states and a given uh, state psi is going to give you um, a function over the complex uh, plane. Um, so this is an approach that has actually been introduced by uh, Segal and Bergman in the in the 60s in the context of more like mathematical physics. Um, and this function has very, very interesting mathematical properties. So it turns out it's a holomorphic function, uh, something that you can write down as like an entire series over the, the complex plane. Uh, at the very high level, you can think of this as like polynomial of infinite degrees. But those objects, they have very interesting mathematical properties. So uh, one of those is factorization. Uh, it turns out any admissible like holomorphic function that, that represents a quantum state can be factorized as follows. Uh, you can write it as the product of um, some something that only depends on the roots uh, on the zeros of that function and another part that is a gaussian function okay and there's an important result why uh, this matters for us uh, in terms of like uh, quantum information processing um, and this is this theorem uh, proven by Lutkenhaus and barnett in 95 um, which is the fact that a state is going to be non-gaussian a pure state uh, if and only if that corresponding function has zeros uh, it's sort of pretty straightforward when you look at this uh, factorization because if the function has no zeros, so this term here, this product is absent and you just have sort of a Gaussian uh, function that, that describe your state, but it turns out the uh, result goes both ways. You, you get an equivalence, uh, which I guess is the non-trivial uh, part. Um, and then uh, if you think, about, uh, think back at uh, what I said about Gaussian processes being classically simulable, this means this product here that makes your state non-Gaussian sort of encodes the, uh, if you wish, the computational um, capability of your uh, quantum state. And so a very natural thing to do um, is to actually count the number of, of zeros here. Um, so this is possible again because uh, that function behaves sort of like a polynomial. So it's uh, in particular, its set of zeros uh, uh, is discrete. Uh, the zeros are sort of isolated from, from each other. So it sort of makes sense to count them. Uh, and the number of zeros, uh, we're just going to name it the stellar rank. Uh, and I'm going to explain to you why this is a, a relevant uh, non-Gaussian measure. Okay, so what this stellar rank does is, starting from just like a binary uh, classification, Gaussian, non-Gaussian, um, it gives you like a full hierarchy uh, of states uh, in this infinite dimensional uh, Hibbert spaces, both in the single mode and the multi-mode case. Uh, where the higher you go in the hierarchy, the, the most non-Gaussian the, the state is. Uh, so to give a bunch of examples, stellar rank zero uh, are the, the Gaussian states. Uh, you have the coherent states, for example, are like close to classical states um, is, in that, uh, in the, is in that set. And as you increase the stellar rank, you, you get Fox states, for example, that are more and more non-Gaussian all the way to a uh, state that you can uh, meet in, in like error correction, for example, cat state, GKP state, binomial state, um, and you can sort of quantify their non-Gaussianity uh, with that notion. Uh, so you see that to each state, we're associating uh, an algebraic de description, essentially, uh, this, this holomorphic function. But the stellar rank is uh, slightly more than just a mathematical definition. It has a bunch of interesting properties. So here I'm going to present three of those that are uh, important for, for the rest of the talk. Um, so the first thing I said, it was a non-Gaussian measure, so might as well have the right properties for that. So the first property is this quantity is conserved under a Gaussian operation. It's, it's invariant under Gaussian uh, unitaries uh, and non-increasing under Gaussian maps. Um, then another more like technical property is, is the fact that the states that have finite stellar rank uh, form a dense subset. Uh, so if you think back at this holomorphic function, it has a product over the, the, the zeros, but that product can be infinite, okay? Uh, and it turns out in practice, you don't need to care uh, too much about this technicality and you can sort of restrict to those uh, states of uh, finite stellar rank. Uh, and the final uh, point that I want to emphasize is the fact that this hierarchy is operational. 
in the sense that this holomorphic description of your state is actually a recipe that tells you this is how you need to apply non-Gaussian operation to the vacuum to generate the state. So this is what I picturally represented here as you know going from uh, one uh, level to, to the next one uh, by acting with this creation operator. This is a non-Gaussian operation. Um, and so you sort of count the number of non-Gaussian operation you need to, to generate the state. Uh, in some sense, you can think of this as uh, the continuous variable equivalent uh, of the, the T count uh, at a high level, the number of T gates uh, you would need to generate uh, a non-Clifford state together with Clifford operations. Okay, and in our work, uh, what we do is to um, essentially um, find a, like a fourth property of, of that stellar rank, the fact that it actually uh, characterizes in a certain sense uh, the computational complexity uh, that you can get to using uh, a quantum state. Okay, so how uh, do we get to that result in practice? Um, this is through strong simulation. So given a very general sampling setup, so you can think of this as being like an arbitrary multimode uh, state, it can be anything uh, over like a tensor product of infinite dimensional Hibber spaces for each of the modes. Um, and you can consider an arbitrary measurement for the, the sake of uh, brevity here. Uh, I'm uh, giving you the case where uh, you just get a tensor product of, of, a, of a rank one projectors. So this is our setup. Uh, and we want to essentially simulate this classically, uh, simulate the sampling uh, classically. Um, so the way to do so is we first assign stellar ranks to each of the components of the setup. Um, so we can always associate up to some finite precision, finite uh, stellar ranks uh, because of this density theorem that I uh, told you before. Um, so we associate uh, a stellar rank to the input state, to each of the states onto which we're, we're projecting at the measurement level. Uh, and then we're sort of putting everything together by just summing those ranks into the total uh, stellar rank of the setup. Um, and the main uh, result uh, stated very informally here is that this uh, sampling uh, experiment can be strongly simulated classically in time that scales polynomially with the size uh, of the computation, so this m here, but exponentially in the total stellar rank of the setup. So uh, this means you're, the stellar rank really captures the, the, the complexity of the, of, the, of the simulation here. And I should uh, specify what I mean by strong simulation. So strong simulation is something uh, that is stronger than just uh, the, the sampling. If you're able to strongly simulate, you can actually also simulate the sampling. Uh, and it's the ability to, uh, given uh, like a, an instance of that problem, uh, compute the, the, any probability, any output probability efficiently or any marginal uh, output probability uh, efficiently. Okay, uh, and so how do we uh, prove that uh, result? This is sort of a two-step process. Um, the first step that I'm going to uh, detail uh, afterwards uh, consists in rewriting this sort of general uh, sampling experiment in a different way, uh, which we call coherent state sampling, uh, where now instead of projecting uh, onto you know, like a known uh, state that could be very non-Gaussian, for example, very resourceful. Uh, we're projecting onto coherent states uh, that are, are sort of less resourceful um, quantum states. Uh, and this comes uh, at the cost of rewriting, um, sort of adding a, a, a layer of Gaussian uh, um, computation in the middle. And uh, the addition of uh, non-Gaussian ancillary states and you need add as many uh, non-Gaussian ancillary state as the stellar rank of, uh, of the measurement uh, projectors. Uh, so here, you really get the feeling that we're essentially taking all, all the resources that we identify in those output states and sort of pulling them towards the input uh, so that we can uh, sort of study that object by saying that all the, resource, uh, all the quantum resources are in the input. Um, and then um, this circuit has this form where uh, it has an input non-Gaussian state that undergoes a fully Gaussian uh, evolution. Um, and so based on the previous results, uh, we can actually get our, our uh, strong uh, simulation. And the way this previous results uh, work is really a, a brute force, essentially. We, we compute general expressions for the output amplitudes of these types uh, of circuits. Uh, and then we use the best classical algorithm uh, known to date to, uh, to get our, our, our simulation uh, uh, results. So essentially, the, the probabilities there, depending on uh, affinance, there are combinatorial objects that are sort of generalizations of permanence. Um, and then we use classical algorithms for computing those affinance uh, to get this result. Okay, so in the remaining time, uh, I want to explain how this reduction uh, 
uh, is done. I think this is this is sort of the core uh, of our uh, result. Um, so to to say it again, uh, here the idea is to take this general sampling setup and put all the resources at the level of the input. Okay, and then perform the most classical measurement possible in, in the sense that I was telling below that we're projecting onto those uh, coherent states. So how do we achieve this? Um, well, the the property that we're going to use is this operational property of the stellar rank uh, that I was mentioning before. Uh, it turns out if uh, I have a like a projector, uh, I, if I'm projecting onto some pure state YK that has some finite stellar rank, which is written here, then uh, there's a constructive way of decomposing that uh, projector uh, as follows. So uh, now you start from a coherent state, you apply some Gaussian operation, and then in, in sequence, you, you apply a bunch of photon additions uh, to this uh, Gaussian state with, with some displacement. So in blue here are Gaussian uh, elements and in orange, uh, non-Gaussian elements. And this really directly stems from uh, the factorization property of the stellar function that, that I mentioned before. And now our goal is pretty clear. Uh, instead of projecting onto YK, we want to project onto those uh, alpha Ks in the output. Um, so we have to move this like red box uh, at the level of the input state. Um, so we can simply do this by playing with a Born rule. So this, this is sort of the original uh, Born rule uh, probability, uh, right? We're projecting row onto, uh, onto the, the YKs. Um, and then we're decomposing the, the YKs as some operation acting uh, on coherent states. Uh, so we get out those coherent states and now we revert those applications uh, to be on the state uh, row instead. Um, and in summary, what uh, is now being applied to row is a bunch of Gaussian operations. And those, uh, well, what were photon additions in sequence, which now in the time reverse version are, uh, well, photon subtraction, so application of this annihilation operate, uh, operator in sequence. Um, and this is a non-Gaussian uh, operation because it features those uh, non-Gaussian operators uh, in the middle. Uh, so we need, again, to break this down. I recall that our goal is really to bring all the resource at the level of the input state. Uh, but the problem is the way you usually implement this uh, is using photon number measurements. So we don't want that. So instead, we introduce uh, another decomposition of uh, photon subtraction. Uh, which is based on using a non-Gaussian uh, ancilla uh, and then a Gaussian operation and, and a Gaussian post-selection, so a, a, like a, a Gaussian projection uh, in the output. Um, and with this, we're sort of able to replace all these photon subtraction uh, here by sort of these bunch of gadgets, uh, which where for each photon subtraction present here, uh, they're being replaced by this non-Gaussian ancilla that ends up uh, being in the input there. Okay, so to sort of summarize the, the whole construction, in the end, we bring all the resources at the level of the states. This is what the corresponding output probability uh, looks like. It is the same that we had here, but sort of rewritten uh, in, uh, in that setting. And you have an error terms that, that comes from the fact that this gadget uh, for the photon subtraction is not exact. So you really have this, this sort of a, a very tedious um, derivation in the paper to show that we can uh, control well uh, these uh, errors and that they, they don't scale badly when we go to the strong simulation setting. Uh, okay, but in the end, this is what we get. We have sort of a general input state that is the re resourceful uh, input. Uh, we're projecting it onto coherent states and, and that input is itself our original input, some ancillary non-Gaussian states, and a Gaussian uh, evolution on, on top of it. OK, so um, I'm going to conclude here. Um, I think the main message, uh, main messages that, that I want to uh, tell you is that um, from like a very general uh, setup, uh, you can reduce it to uh, another setup uh, where resources are easier to study. So in this case, uh, any bosonic sampling computation, uh, any instance uh, of such a computation, we map it to a different instance uh, of a coherent state sampling. And this construction allows us to prove that the stellar rank provides uh, well, a computational measure uh, of non-Gaussianity. If your stellar rank is too low, we give a, a classical algorithm that is very general and that allows you to simulate the whole setup. Um, so finally, I'm going to mention um, two open questions. There's a bunch of open questions standing from, from that work, uh, but two that I find particularly uh, interesting. Um, so the first thing that is sort of obvious is here, I, I kept talking about uh, non-Gaussianity. 
But of course, you can arbitrarily get non-Gaussianity at the single mode level. So you could think of like a very non-Gaussian state that is just a tensor product of, of single mode non-Gaussian states. Uh, and sure, surely this is easy to, to simulate, right? So you need entanglement as well. Uh, this is sort of hidden in, in the scalings uh, of the informal theorem that I, that I was showing you before. Um, and uh, so we talk a bit about this in the paper, uh, but there is a sort of a deeper uh, study of non-Gaussian entanglement uh, to be done, like uh, uh, how is it, uh, what's the good definition for that notion, and, um, and you know, how does it um, uh, affect the, the cost of classical simulation. And the other um, uh, open direction that I think is very interesting is uh, I made this link between like the stellar rank counting the number of non-Gaussian uh, operations necessary to engineer a state uh, that is very similar to like the t-count uh, in discrete variable quantum computing. Um, and one place where this t-count is used is, is actually in getting better classical simulation of uh, quantum computations. Um, so you replace the t-gates by t-states uh, and then you find like stabilizer uh, rank decomposition uh, uh, for those copies for those multiple copies of, of uh, t states, and so there's a very similar thing that you could do here, right? If if you were to like introduce this this uh, continuous variable equivalent of the stabilizer rank, which uh, would be the Gaussian rank, you could say, okay, how like what's the size of a Gaussian rank decomposition that I can find for these uh, uh, input uh, photons, and this would give you a uh, like a, a clear improvement on the, the very generic uh, strong simulation algorithm that we gave. Okay, so with this, uh, I'm going to conclude and thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, do we have any questions? One or two? Back on here. Oh, okay, good. Um, uh, hi, my name is Aurel. I might have missed that part. So when you, uh, I don't know, can you I, hear me? I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I really can't hear you. Uh, uh, okay, I can, is it better this way? You should, I think you should go no. to the stairs and use that uh, talking to the computer. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, excuse me, I really can't hear you. Would you mind going to the, um, yeah, yes, yes. Okay. to the stage? Um, no. Yes. Is it okay? Yeah, now I hear. Okay, good. I, I was told to come here on stage. So, um, Perfect, thanks. Right, uh, it's very interesting. Um, so um, I, I might have missed that part, but, um, but I want to try. So when you talk about the, the level of non-Gaussianity, uh, which part of the, of the sampling experiment you're referring to? The input, the, the, the map? So both, both, both. So <clears throat> uh, what we're doing is like sort of assigning, assigning a measure of non-Gaussianity to all the elements uh, in the circuit and then bringing all of this to the input. But, but uh, the total stellar rank, when I mentioned this, um, is really um, the, the measure of the whole circuit. You, you sort of sum all the contributions of all the parts of the circuit. Okay, and, 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 and what are the properties? So is it like additive or how does the standard rank? rank? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's additive with respect to tensor product. Uh, yeah, it has a bunch of other mathematical properties, but essentially all the natural properties you would expect of uh, like a, a resource monot monotone. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Thank you very much. Sure. Maybe it's a trivial question. Is there a deeper relationship between non cliffordness or non stabilizerness and non Gaussianity, or is it just an analogy between the two? It's just an analogy. So there is a natural sort of extension of, uh, of like a T gate that you could do. Uh, if you think of like Clifford being Gaussian, um, then uh, the equivalent of like the, the, the first, um, the third level, sorry, of the, of the Clifford hierarchy would be. Um, essentially states that you can build from Gaussian states using exponential of Hamiltonians <clears throat> that are cubic in the creation annihilation operators, but this is not what we do. So it's really it's really an analogy at the level of uh, like resources, uh, but there's not like a clean mathematical link between the two. Uh, could you come forward? Thank you. 
So we have uh, we have another question. Yeah. Hello. Thank yep. you for the talk. I just wanted to ask if there are other measures of non-Gaussianity, like uh, trace distance, which are useful in these sorts of applications and contexts. Yes. So, um, like a very natural thing you can do <coughs> in continuous variable um, is associate phase space descriptions uh, to your state. So I don't know if you heard of the Wigner function, for example. Yeah. This is one like standard way. Um, and so usually uh, negativity of the Wigner function is taken as another um, sort of measure. The difference is it, it doesn't quite give you a hierarchy of states. Um, you, it, it doesn't map well to sort of the non-Gaussian properties uh, of the state, but you can still use it to ask about hardness of simulation. So there are simulation results that are based on the volume of negativity, uh, which is the like one norm of, uh, of the Wigner function. Um, and so based on this, you would have a cost that depends on sort of the total negativity of the, of the setup. Uh, th that's sort of the natural uh, yeah, measure that I'm aware of. All right, okay, thank you. Just... Any... Oh, so we have one more. Sorry, um, just just another one. Um, yeah. So you're talking about you're talking about strong simulation, and what about the approximation? Do you have any feeling, or did you any do any like preliminary calculations on how how, how the stellar rank would be related to the approximation? Yes. So so we do this in sort of the appendix of the paper, uh, and indeed for some states it's, it can be very non-trivial. Like if you take a GKP state that is very very close to ideal, you expect that the stellar rank is going to be uh, extremely high as well. Um, so we do sort of this analysis uh, in the in the paper. Uh, now, was, uh, like a sort of a standard example that I can give you is if you think about um, all these models that I showed that are variants of boson sampling. Uh, in this case, you have no approximation error because those are those always have like sort of a bounded uh, um, either they're Gaussian or or they, the the input states have a bounded support over the fog basis, and for all of those, you you get a direct uh, like the stellar rank is really uh, exact decomposition, and you don't have a, you don't pay a estimation price. And the other thing that I should say actually. Uh, there is a, <clears throat> a bit of error that lies in that uh, O of uh, Xi to the 2N, whatever that I showed on the slide. Um, so this, this error terms enter the, the simulation. And what we get in the end is actually strong simulation for a probability distribution, which is like arbitrarily closing total variation distance to the true one, which I think is a relevant uh, sort of measure for quantum advantage experiment. Uh, but yeah, just want to mention it. Uh. No, OK, good. Thank you. That's very cool. Okay, um, one, last, one last question. Could you come forward? Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, okay, the, st the stellar representation uh, you defined for pure states, uh, right? Is that yeah. a, a generalization for uh, uh, mixed states? This is the first question. Yes, there is. <laughs> okay. And, uh, uh, and I want to ask uh, if uh, this. Uh, okay. Uh, so it it looks like this. So it's it's what you would expect from say the theory of entanglement, where you define the Schmidt rank for pure states, <clears throat> and then you extend it to mixed state. Uh, so this is called like a convex roof uh, decomposition, essentially. Um, and this is a notion that usually is very hard to compute. Like if you give me a mixed state, it's, it's in general very hard to compute the Schmidt rank. It's very hard to compute the, the stellar rank. Uh, but in the case of the stellar rank, you get, um, you have ways of computing witnesses. So you have ways of at least getting good lower bounds uh, on those quantities, even if those are, are mixed states. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and another quick question. Uh, sure. So if you find, for example, that uh, uh, I don't remember the name, the stellar rank, uh, if I remember the question. Okay, if you find that the stellar rank is, uh, for example, uh, 10, you can uh, find a uh, lower bound on the traced distance between your state uh, and uh, any given, uh, and uh, so the minimum distance uh, between uh, uh, your state uh, and the set of Gaussian states, there is uh, such a lower bound. 
Yes, so actually it's slightly different, but <clears throat> if I have a state of rank n, so in this case, let's say 10, uh, I know that I can actually decompose it as um, a state of bounded support of size at most 10 and a Gaussian unitary acting on it. And it turns out there is a, an efficient algorithm to actually compute that, that uh, decomposition. Um, so you actually get a... Um, yeah, you, you get a general, so you, you not only get what you say, which is the distance uh, with respect to Gaussian state, but you can also get a full, um, we call this sort of stellar profiles. This is sort of a, the set of maximal achievable fidelities at each given rank, meaning that the, the first point is going to be the distance with the set of uh, Gaussian states. Then the second point, which might be slightly higher, is going to be the distance with the set of uh, states that have stellar rank one and so on. And so this sort of tells you as you increase the stellar rank, uh, how good an approximation you can get of your state. Um, so I don't know, for example, you can show that uh, if I have a Fox state uh, uh, like two, for example, um, then there's no way to, to get uh, like better than, I don't know, maybe 0.3 fidelity with it with a Gaussian state, and then maybe 0.5 fidelity with it with a state of stellar rank one. And then you get to exact fidelity at stellar rank two because it has stellar rank two. So yes, yes, you, you get those uh, sort of bounds of, on the distance of, of um, yeah, of these uh, sets. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Cheers. Okay, um, thank you for the very uh, interesting talk. Uh, thank please you. Please join me to thank uh, Ulysses and all the speakers of the section.